Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. My name is Art and I'll be your host for the coziest Christmas show that you will listen to this week in the month of March. I've got a full episode ahead and I'm looking forward to getting into it with you all. Before we do get started, I want to give a, a big shout out to a new Christmas podcast. It's called the North Pole News Dispatch and it is hosted by Ken Smith from the Faces to Places podcast. I heard the promo and just got done listening to the first episode and it's a marvelous, marvelous podcast. He decided to uh, retire and head up north to the North Pole and, and Santa put him to work right away. So we'll be getting some uh, Christmas news dispatches direct from the North Pole throughout the year. And so I would love for you to check that out and give him a listen. I think you'll enjoy this one. I could listen to Ken talk all day. I tell you what, his voice is this deep Southern sound to it. And it's, it's really good. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. So check out his podcast. If you want some uh, new Christmas podcast coming at you this year. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of a serious subject, uh, war and uh, specifically Christmas at war. But uh, before we get to that point, I want to, I do want to take a minute to head over to the cozy Christmas book corner to see what I've been reading this month. And I have a couple of recommendations for you. I'm really enjoying reading along with all of you. Let's head over to the Cozy Christmas Book Corner. We are hosting a year-long reading challenge where every month we're giving a new reading prompt to you. And this month's reading prompt is the Polar Express. The challenge is to read a book that has to do with travel. It can be a Christmas book. It can be a non-Christmas book. It doesn't matter. The choice is up to you. What am I reading this month? For the prompt, I am reading a book called The Christmas Joy Ride by Melody Carlson. It's a beautiful looking book. I was struck by the cover art immediately. It tells a story of Joy, who is an 85-year-old Christmas fanatic. In fact, she hosts a Christmas blog. She writes a Christmas blog. And she is going to go on one last Christmas joyride across country in her RV. She's going to stop at some of her readers' houses to deliver them Christmas gifts. And uh, she had a contest on her blog where people could write in and tell about why they needed Christmas spirit. And uh, so she chose some winners. And now she's taking boxes of Christmas decorations and presents to people's houses because she knows her time is is drawing to a close. Uh, you know, she's 85, 86 years old, and uh, she knows she probably doesn't have too many more Christmases left. Along the way, she is joined with her neighbor, uh, a young woman named Miranda, who is going to help her drive and deliver these gifts. And so they go on a cross-country trip, delivering Christmas joy to people who are in need. And it's such a cozy, cheerful, kind book that uh, it really put me in the mood for Christmas. And I was excited to read that that Joy was a Christmas blogger because that's like that's like old school Christmas podcasting, isn't it? <laughs> so when I first got the book, I thought Miranda would be kind of a Grinch-like character who would need a redemption arc along the way. Uh, but she's she's really not. She's more of a lost soul that her life has kind of come to a crossroads and she's not sure what to do next. And I kind of felt that, you know, I, I feel like maybe I'm in that same spot, although mine's probably just a midlife crisis, <laughs> but I've been going on one for a couple of years now. There is a, a Grinch-like character in this novel, but they don't meet him until about halfway through, I think. Partway through the novel, something happens to Joy that causes Miranda to have to take up the mantle and carry on in her stead. And I, I love that she then, uh, and so she, uh, so Miranda then has to make some difficult choices. Does she carry on or do they call it a wrap on, on the Christmas joy ride? And fortunately, uh, along the way, Miranda meets a hunky widow, or excuse me, a hunky widower who uh, is in need of some Christmas cheer. So that's all I'll say about that. Other than to say, 
If you love Hallmark movies, you will love this book. This book needs to be a Hallmark movie. I think this would make an amazing Hallmark movie. Uh, it's it's really it just follows that pattern, and I don't mean say that to diminish it. It's a good it's a good story. I I enjoyed it. To judge it on its Christmas spirit, I mean this book is full of Christmas spirit. The main character's name is Joy, and she's her nickname is Christmas Joy, and she's driving in this beautifully decorated RV for that's decorated for Christmas, and she's going to people who are in need. To, and giving them gifts and Christmas decorations and all all that they need to help celebrate Christmas. I mean, this book is overflowing with Christmas spirit. Um, so high marks on Christmas spirit. This RV, I, I'm really obsessed with this RV, guys. And the way it looks, I, I need this RV in my life, okay? You know, I'm imagining driving around, uh, using it as a like a mobile podcast studio. I could take cozy Christmas podcast on the road and podcast from different locations around the country. I mean, sign me up. I need this. <laughs> okay. I found my new life's calling here. If I ever get rich, that's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but yeah, I, I really, I, I love the imagination behind it and, and just the, the comfort and joy that the book brings. The characters are, are funny and interesting and really brought some great Christmas joy to my March. That's my pick for this month's reading, uh, reading prompt. And again, I would love to know what you're reading for the prompt and what you've read for past prompts. What And as we go along, let us know what you're reading uh, for those prompts to come. So I would give this novel uh, four cups of eggnog. Um, very well done. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I wanted to mention just a second book I read that I kind of enjoyed. Uh, and Thought I'd pass that along to you as well. Um, not it's not part of the reading prompt, but it's just an extra one. A Christmas story I read called Christmas Corpse. It is the first book in the Christmas Cozy Mystery series, written by Mona Marple. And uh, here's what the book says it's about. Holly Wood, and yes, that's her real name, is driving home for Christmas and not feeling too happy about the empty house waiting for her. When her car skids into a snowbank, she's rescued by a sweet old lady who promises. Her name is Mrs. Claus. Holly is taken to Candy Cane Hollow to recover and finds herself in a genuine winter wonderland. As Christmas Day approaches, the grouchy medical receptionist appears to have been poisoned by a mince pie. And to Holly's surprise, Mrs. Claus is the prime suspect. With Mrs. Claus under suspicion, Holly vows to return the woman's generosity by clearing her name. Maybe it will impress Mrs. Claus' dimpled dish of a son, too? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this, this book was was fun. I, I couldn't help but make comparisons to Liz Ireland's Mrs. Claus series, although in this one, Mrs. Claus is the main character, uh, but Holly is. You know, I I still think Liz Ireland's series is far and away the the better of the two. I, I'm giving it three cups of eggnog. There's Christmas spirit and spades, and it's a cozy mystery, so there's a lot of coziness to it. It would be a great read at, at Christmas time because it's it's short. It's only about 140 pages, if that. And I think it's actually more of a novella than a than a novel. So that might appeal to you. Like I've said before, sometimes those shorter books are best read at Christmas time because it, we, we're just so busy. We don't always have time to sit down and read the big honkers. But then the, the cover art is a really lovely picture again. I, I read it on Kindle, so I don't have it a physical copy. I'm not sure. Maybe this one was only available on Kindle. I'm not sure. I'll leave links to these books in the show notes. You can check those out. I would recommend those. Stay tuned uh, for our next episode that's coming out at the end of the month. Um, I have a special guest on. We're going to be talking about the book, The Polar Express, because that's another book I read this month that I had not read before. Yes, it's a children's story, but it's a marvelous, charming little children's story. And I thoroughly enjoyed it getting a chance to read that. Uh, unfortunately, my children are a bit beyond the age of me reading them picture books, but hey, I could have grandkids coming. <laughs> okay, not anytime soon, don't worry. Uh, but probably sooner than uh, I, I would expect, um, you, you know, maybe 10 years and I could have those. So, I, you know, I, I'm definitely going to add that to future traditions. And I can't believe I'm sitting here talking about potentially potential grandchildren 
<laughs> so uh, with that, I think I'm going to go and cry for a while, drink some tea and uh, unwind. So here, I hope you enjoyed uh, this, this quick little edition of the Cozy Book Corner. So stay tuned. I'll be posting these videos off and on throughout the year. I might increase that as we get closer to Christmas time, but we'll see. All right, enough of me rambling. You all take care and have a very Merry Christmas. I know we were all hoping that 2022 would be a year that the world bounces back, that the pandemic would end, that things would go back to a peaceful state. I, I don't know if I could ever say we'd go back to normal because I think the new normal is going to be very different. But unfortunately, this year has already seen its share of tragedy from the pandemic having a big spike to uh, the current situation happening in Ukraine. And I know I have some listeners there. And again, I just want you all to know that I'm thinking of you and, and we're praying for you. And I know many of people of faith here in our country are also praying for you all. So hang in there and we are hoping that there will be peace. So I, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite historical events, and it's what's called the Christmas Truce of 1914. World War I began in the year 1914, and it quickly became a very violent conflict. That first year of the war, on and around Christmas Day, a temporary truce was called that allowed soldiers, both German and British soldiers, they were able to go out into no man's land and gather up their dead Christmas music started being sung, and before anyone knew it, a full-out Christmas celebration began with both sides coming together in peace to celebrate Christmas. Of course, Christmas would have been a major holiday for German soldiers, just as well as it was for, for the British. What I love about this story is that it happened on Christmas Day. Like The whole meaning of Christmas is to bring peace to the world, and it's one of my biggest regrets that that truce was not able to be continued on and bring an early end to the war and that there would have been peace. I'm looking up this article on history.com and I wanted to read portions of it to you because I, I think it's just well said. And I'll have the link to the original article down in the show notes and I'd encourage you to go and read the full thing if you'd like more detail on the Christmas truce. Starting on Christmas Eve, many German and British troops fighting in World War I sang Christmas carols to each other across the lines, and at certain points the Allied soldiers even heard brass bands joining the Germans in their joyous singing. At the first light of dawn on Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across no man's land, calling out Merry Christmas in their enemies' native tongues. At first, the Allied soldiers feared it was a trick. But seeing the Germans unarmed, they climbed out of their trenches and shook hands with the enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and sang carols and songs. Some Germans lit Christmas trees around their trenches, and there was even a documented case of soldiers from opposing sides playing a good-natured game of soccer. German Lieutenant Kurt Zemmeich recalled how marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. Some soldiers used the short-lived ceasefire for a more somber task, the retrieval of the bodies of fellow combatants who had fallen within the no-man's land between the lines. And that's a portion from the article at history.com. Then there's another article I came across called uh, World War I's Christmas Truce When Fighting Paused for the Holiday, it tells the story of the Christmas truce um, in a little more detail. Um, interestingly, uh, this article also says that you know not everyone was on board with this truce. It said, in another account, a German scolded his fellow soldiers during the Christmas truce. Quote, such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor left? That 25-year-old soldier's name was Adolf Hitler. But he wasn't the only one who disapproved of this. There were others, and 
high command of the British soldiers who disagreed with this. Today, that there is a memorial that stands in England's National Memorial Arboretum commemorating the Christmas truce, and it was dedicated by Prince William of England. On the 100th anniversary in 2014, the English and German national soccer teams staged a friendly match in England in remembrance of the soldiers' impromptu soccer games in 1914. I think this is one of the most beautiful stories that has come out of war. Because, honestly, there's nothing beautiful about war. People are losing their lives. Families are being separated. And it's, you know, it's hard. It hurts. And I have a story to read today that I really debated whether or not I should read. Because I loved it. It, It's good, but it's not cozy. (laughs) It was written by Canadian author Stephen Leacock. Stephen Leacock was born in Canada in December of 1869, and he died in 1944. He is known for his lighthearted in comic stories, but this one is a sobering story that he wrote. From what I uh, could research online, he wrote this story. It's called Merry Christmas, and he, he wrote it in response to the world war that was happening at the time. It was a new war. Uh, many had thought that, that the boys would be home by Christmas, and it just didn't happen. And so he writes almost like a cautionary tale and portrays Father Christmas in a very interesting light. You'll see as I read the story. One article says that he uses the character of Father Christmas as a symbolic guardian of all our innocence, cruelly turned into a mad, shell-shocked victim of war, to bring his message home. Using a device that pays homage to his favorite author, Charles Dickens, in the classic A Christmas Carol, Leacock, himself a character in the drama, is visited by two spirits over the course of one night. These otherworldly visitations will lead to a transformation, one that empowers the author to use his writing as a tool for peace. And so with that, uh, we will go ahead and settle in for our story. This story, as I said, is a hard one to read, but it has such a hopeful message to it. Merry Christmas by Stephen Leacock My dear young friend, said Father Time, as he laid his hand gently upon my shoulder, you are entirely wrong. Then I looked up over my shoulder from the table at which I was sitting and I saw him. But I had known or felt for at least the last half hour that he was standing somewhere near me. You have had, I do not doubt, good reader, more than once that strange uncanny feeling that there is someone unseen standing beside you in a darkened room, let us say with a dying fire, when the night has grown late and the October wind sounds low outside, and when through the thin curtain that we call reality, the unseen world starts for a moment clear upon our dreaming sense. You have had it? Yes, I know you have. Never mind telling me about it. Stop, I don't want to hear about that strange presentment you had the night your Aunt Eliza broke her leg. Don't let's bother with your experience. I want to tell mine. You are quite mistaken, my dear young friend, repeated Father Time. Quite wrong. Young friend, I said, my mind as one's mind is apt to, in such a case, run into an unimportant detail. Why do you call me young? Your pardon, he answered gently. He had a gentle way with him, had father time. The fault is in my failing eyes. I took you at first sight for something under a hundred. Under a hundred? I expostulated. Well, I should think so. Your pardon again, said time. The fault is in my failing memory. I forgot. You seldom pass that nowadays, do you? Your life is very short of late. I heard him breathe a wistful, hollow sigh. Very ancient and dim he seemed as he stood beside me, but I did not turn to look upon him. I had no need to. I knew his form and the inner and clearer side of things, as well as every human being knows by innate instinct, the unseen face and form of Father Time. I could hear him murmuring beside me. Short, short, your life is short. Till the sound of it seemed to mingle with the measured ticking of a clock somewhere in the silent house. 
Then I remembered what he had said. How do you know that I am wrong? I asked, and how can you tell what I was thinking? You said it out loud, answered Father Time, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. You said that Christmas was all played out and done with. Yes, I admitted. That's what I said. And what makes you think that? he questioned, stooping, so it seemed to me, still further over my shoulder. Why? I answered. The trouble is this. I have been sitting here for hours, sitting till goodness only knows how far into the night, trying to think out something to write for a Christmas story, and it won't go. It can't be done, not in these awful days. A Christmas story? Yes. You see, Father Time, I explained, glad with the foolish little vanity of my trade to be able to tell him something that I thought enlightening. All the Christmas stuff. Stories and jokes and pictures is all done, you know, in October. I thought it would have surprised him, but I was mistaken. Dear me, he said, not till October. What a rush. How well I remember in ancient Egypt, as I think you call it, seeing them getting out their Christmas things all cut in hieroglyphics, always two or three years ahead. Two or three years, I exclaimed. Pooh, said Time. That was nothing. Why, in Babylon they used to get their Christmas jokes ready, all baked in clay, a whole solar eclipse ahead of Christmas. They said, I think, that the public preferred them so. Egypt? I said. Babylon? But surely, Father Time, there was no Christmas in those days. I thought, my dear boy, he interrupted gravely, don't you know that there has always been Christmas? I was silent. Father Time had moved across the room and stood beside the fireplace, leaning on the mantelpiece. The little wreaths of smoke from the fading fire seemed to mingle with his shadowy outline. Well, he said presently, what is it that is wrong with Christmas? Why, I answered, all the romance, the joy, the beauty of it has gone, crushed and killed by the greed of commerce and the horrors of war. I am not, as you thought I was, a hundred years old, but I can conjure up, as anybody can, a picture of Christmas in the good old days of a hundred years ago. The quaint, old-fashioned houses, standing deep among the evergreens, with the light twinkling from the windows on the snow, the warmth and comfort within, the great fire roaring on the hearth, the merry guests grouped about its blaze, and the little children with their eyes dancing in the Christmas firelight waiting for Father Christmas in his fine mummery of red and white and cotton wool to hand the presents from the yuletide tree. I can see it, I added, as if it were yesterday. It was but yesterday, said Father Time, and his voice seemed to soften with the memory of bygone years. I remember it well. Ah, I continued, that was Christmas indeed. Give me back such days as those, with the old good cheer, the old stage coaches in the gabled inns, and the warm red wine, the snapdragon in the Christmas tree, and I'll believe again in Christmas, yes, in Father Christmas himself. Believe in him, said Time quietly. You may well do that. He happens to be standing outside in the street at this moment. Outside? I exclaimed. Why don't he come in? He's afraid to said Father Time. He's frightened, and he dared come in unless you ask him. May I call him in? I signified assent, and Father Time went to the window for a moment and beckoned into the darkened street. Then I heard footsteps, clumsy and hesitant they seemed, upon the stairs. And in a moment, a figure stood framed in the doorway. The figure of Father Christmas. He stood shuffling his feet, a timid, apologetic look upon his face. How changed he was! I had known in my mind's eye from childhood up the face and form of Father Christmas as well as that of old time himself. Everybody knows, or once knew him, a jolly little rounded man with a great muffler wound about him, a packet of toys upon his back with such merry twinkling eyes and rosy cheeks as are only given by the touch of the driving snow and the rude fun of the north wind. Why, there was once a time, not so long ago, when the very sound of his sleigh bells sent the blood running warm to the heart. But now, how changed! All draggled with the mud and rain he stood, as if no house had sheltered him these three years past. 
His old red jersey was tattered in a dozen places, his muffler frayed and raveled. The bundle of toys that he dragged with him in a net seemed wet and worn till the cardboard boxes gaped asunder. There were boxes among them, I vow, that he must have been carrying these three past years. But most of all I noted the change that had come over the face of Father Christmas. The old brave look of cheery confidence was gone. The smile that had beamed responsive to the laughing eyes of countless children around unnumbered Christmas trees was there no more and in the place of it there showed a look of timid apology, of apprehensiveness, as of one who was asked in vain the warmth and shelter of a human home. Such a look as the harsh cruelty of this world has stamped upon the faces of its outcasts. So stood Father Christmas, shuffling upon the threshold, fumbling his poor, tattered hat in his hand. Shall I come in? he said, his eyes appealingly on Father Time. Come, said Time. He turned to speak to me. Your room is dark. Turn up the lights. He's used to light, bright light and plenty of it. The dark has frightened him these three years past. I turned up the lights, and the bright glare revealed all the more cruelly the tattered figure before us. Father Christmas advanced a timid step across the floor. Then he paused, as if in sudden fear. Is this floor mine? He said. No, no, said Time soothingly, and to me he added in a murmured whisper, He's afraid. He was blown up in a mine in no man's land between the trenches at Christmas time in 1914. It broke his nerve. May, may I put my toys on that machine gun? asked Father Christmas timidly. It will help to keep them dry. It is not a machine gun, said Time gently. See, it is only a pile of books upon the sofa. And to me, he whispered, They turned a machine gun on him in the streets of Warsaw. He thinks he sees them everywhere since then. It's all right, Father Christmas, I said, speaking as cheerily as I could, while I rose and stirred the fire into a blaze. There are no machine guns here, and there are no mines. This is but the house of a poor rider. Ah, said Father Christmas, lowering his tattered hat still further and attempting something of a humble bow. A rider. Are you Hans Andersen, perhaps? <laughs> not quite, I answered. But a great writer, I do not doubt, said the old man with a humble courtesy that he had learned, it well may be, centuries ago in the yuletide season of his northern home. The world owes much to its great books. I carry some of the greatest with me always. I have them here. He began fumbling among the limp and tattered packages that he carried. Look! The house that Jack built, a marvellous deep thing, sir. And this, the babes in the wood. Will you take it, sir? A poor present, but a present still. Not so long ago. I gave them in thousands every Christmas time. None seem to want them now. He looked appealingly towards Father Time, as the weak may look towards the strong for help and guidance. None want them now, he repeated, and I could see the tears start in his eyes. Why is it so? Has the world forgotten its sympathy with the lost children wandering in the wood? All the world, I heard Time murmur with a sigh, is wandering in the wood. But out loud he spoke to Father Christmas in cheery admonition. Tut, tut, good Christmas, he said. You must cheer up. Here, sit in this chair, the biggest one. So, beside the fire, let us stir it to a blaze. More wood, that's better. And listen, good old friend to the wind outside. Almost a Christmas wind, is it not? Merry and boisterous enough for all the evil times it stirs among. Old Christmas seated himself beside the fire, his hands outstretched towards the flames. Something of his old-time cheeriness seemed to flicker across his features as he warmed himself at the blaze. That's better, he murmured. I was cold, sir, cold, chilled to the bone. Of old I never felt it so. No matter what the wind, the world seemed warm about me. Why is it not so now? You see, said Time, speaking low in a whisper from my ear alone, how sunk and broken he is. Will you not help? Gladly, I answered, if I can. All can, said Father Time, every one of us. 
Meantime, Christmas had turned towards me a questioning eye, in which, however, there seemed to revive some little gleam of merriment. Have you, perhaps, he asked timidly, schnapps? Schnapps, I repeated. Aye, schnapps. A glass of it to drink your health might warm my heart again, I think. Oh, I said, something to drink? His one failing, whispered Time, if it is one. Forgive it him. He was used to it for centuries. Give it to him if you have it. I keep a little in the house, I said, reluctantly, perhaps, in case of illness. Tut, tut, said Father Time, as something as near as could be to a smile passed over his shadowy face. In case of illness. They used to say that in ancient Babylon. Here, let me pour it for him. Drink, Father Christmas, drink! Marvelous it was to see the old man smack his lips as he drank his glass of liquor, neat after the fashion of old Norway. Marvelous, too, to see the way in which, with the warmth of the fire and the generous glow of the spirits, his face changed and brightened till the old-time cheerfulness beamed again upon it. He looked upon, he looked about him, as it were, with a new and growing interest. A pleasant room, he said, and what better, sir, than the wind without and a brave fire within? Then his eye fell upon the mantelpiece, where lay among the litter of books and pipes a little toy horse. Ah, said Father Christmas almost gaily, children in the house. One, I answered, the sweetest boy in all the world. I'll be bound he is, said Father Christmas, and he broke now into a merry laugh that did one's heart good to hear. Ho, 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 they all are, Lord bless me, the number that I have seen, and each and every one, and quite right, too, the sweetest child in all the world. And how old do you say? Two and a half, all but two months, except a week? The very sweetest age of all, I'll bet you say, eh? What? They all do. And the old man broke again into such a jolly chuckling of laughter that his snow-white locks shook upon his head. Ho, 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 ho. But stop a bit, he added. This horse is broken. Tut, tut, a hind leg nearly off. This won't do. He had the toy in his lap in a moment, mending it. It was wonderful to see, for all his age, how deft his fingers were. Time, he said, and it was amusing to note that his voice had assumed almost an authoritative tone. Reach me that piece of string. That's right. Here, hold your finger across the knot. There. Now then, a bit of beeswax. What? No beeswax? Oh, tut tut, how ill supplied your houses are today. How can you mend toys, sir, without beeswax? Still, it will stand up now. I tried to murmur my best thanks, but Father Christmas waved my gratitude aside. Nonsense, he said. That's nothing. That's my life. Perhaps the little boy would like a book, too. I have them here in the packet. Here, sir, Jack and the Beanstalk. Most profound thing. I read it to myself often... I read it to myself often still. How damp it is. Pray, sir, will you let me dry my books before your fire? Only too willingly, I said. How wet and torn they are. Father Christmas had risen from his chair and was fumbling among his tattered packages, taking them from his children's books, all limp and draggled from the rain and wind. All wet and torn, he murmured, and his voice sank again into sadness. I have carried them these three years past. Look, these were for little children in Belgium and in Serbia. Can I get them to them, think you? Time gently shook his head. But presently, perhaps, said Father Christmas, if I dry and mend them. Look, some of them were inscribed already. This one, you see, was written with Father's love. Why has it never come to him? Is it rain or tears upon the page? He stood bowed over his little books, his hands trembling as he turned the pages. Then he looked up, the old fear upon his face again. That sound, he said, listen. I, it, it is guns. I hear them. No, no, I said, it is nothing, only a car passing in the street below. Listen, he said, hear that again, voices crying. No, no, I answered. Not voices, only the night wind among the trees. My children's voices, he exclaimed. I hear them everywhere. They come to me in every wind. And I see them as I wander in the night and storm. My children, 
torn, and dying in the trenches. Beaten into the ground, I hear them crying from the hospitals, each one to me, still as I knew him once, a little child. Time! Time! he cried, reaching out his arms in appeal. Give me back my children! They do not die in vain, Time murmured gently, but Christmas only moaned in answer. Give me back my children! Then he sank down upon his pile of books and toys, his head buried in his arms. You see, said Time, his heart is breaking, and will you not help him if you can? Only too gladly, I replied, but what is there to do? This, said Father Time, listen. He stood before me grave and solemn, a shadowy figure but half seen, though he was close beside me. The firelight had died down and through the curtain windows there came already the first dim brightening of dawn. The world that once you knew, said Father Time, seems broken and destroyed about you. You must not let them know, the children. The cruelty and the horror and the hate that racks the world today, keep it from them. Some day he will know. Here Time pointed to the prostrate form of Father Christmas, that his children, that once were, have not died in vain, that from their sacrifice shall come a nobler, better world for all to live in, a world where countless happy children shall hold bright their memory forever. But for the children of today, save and spare them all you can from the evil hate and horror of the war. Later they will know and understand. Not yet. Give them back their Merry Christmas and its kind thoughts and its Christmas charity till later on there shall be with it again peace upon earth, good will towards men. His voice ceased. It seemed to vanish, as it were, in the sighing of the wind. I looked up. Father Time and Christmas had vanished from the room. The fire was low, and the day was breaking visibly outside. Let us begin, I murmured. I will mend this broken horse. And that was Merry Christmas by Stephen Leacock. And as I mentioned before, it's a pretty dark story. But then 1914 was a very dark year. And World War I was a very dark time. I like the ending of the story, especially, you know, the, the heartache that Father Christmas feels seeing his children slaughtered on the battlefield. And then uh, Father Time has an answer to him is that we've got to teach our children peace. I think about some of the wars fought and, you know, they were fought for good, good causes, good reasons. Unfortunately, though, many, many died. They did not die in vain. I think about the ending of this story a lot, and I hope that Father Christmas is doing well today. I'm pretty sure he's doing okay now, uh, or at least this past Christmas he was. What I love about this is the very last sentence that when uh, the father says that I will mend this broken horse, that he's going to shelter his, his child from the evils outside. He's going to teach him about peace. He's going to make sure that Christmas is fun for him. And it's going to begin with a simple act of kindness, of fixing a broken toy. That's where it's going to begin. We often wonder what our little acts of kindness can do and accomplish in the world. But I, I think they accomplish much. You know, and th this is a story I think about when I think of the question, with things as dark as they are and have been, should I even be doing a, a silly podcast like this? when there are more serious things happening in the world. And yes, absolutely yes, because the message I hope you get from this podcast is to be kind, to seek peace, to celebrate with joy the best day of the year, to 
spend time reading stories, to listen, as Father Time says, to listen to people, maybe people you don't agree with, but find common ground and make peace. Um, It's the powerful message that Christmas brings us. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this story. In the next episode, we'll be back to the the usual laughter and fun and and cozy Christmas stories. I've got uh, a bunch planned, but I really wanted to take a moment just for some somber reflection on the state of things and what can we do? Well, it begins with kindness. It begins with charity. How can we demonstrate that even in a small way to those around us? Powerful story. The one simple act can make all the difference to somebody's world. So with that, I hope you are all doing well and are safe and are warm, that you know that you are loved and that you know peace. Until next time, I want to remind you to be kind to each other, to do good. And let's remember to honor Christmas in our heart and try to keep it all the year. Have a very Merry Christmas.